Hey folks, this is Riker, and just when you thought the Diablo 4 devs couldn't make Helltides any better for Season 4, a juicy new data mine gave us a glimpse of something we'll all want to be using in Helltide going forward. We'll also talk about the massive invasion from Deep Space in Helldivers 2, and the community's mixed response to the latest updates. Plus, what Ubisoft did this time to piss off everyone. We'll get to all that, but we'll start with some rapid-fire news. We got this week the reveal trailer for Slay the Spire 2 which enters Steam Early Access in 2025. This sequel to the award-winning roguelike deck builder had its game engine remade from the ground up in Godot after the whole Unity controversy that we've covered in the past. We're also just a few days away from No Rest for the Wicked hitting Early Access on April 18th. That's an ARPG by the creators of Ori and the Blind Forest. I just released an interview video with gameplay this week. I love how Passionately, the studio heads talk about their game and the ARPG genre. They have some really different ideas on how to approach the ARPG. They're really breathing fresh air into the genre and taking a different approach. I've tried the game and I'm really looking forward to diving into it once it launches, and I hope you folks are interested in it as well, because I'd really like to make content for this game. Our next quick news update is from this video's sponsor, Torchlight Infinite. The SS4 expansion, Whispering Mist, is launching on April 18th at 7 p.m. Pacific. I legit always have fun playing this game at the start of a new season. The gameplay is smooth, progression is fast, there's a lot of mechanics and build customization. It's all very a path of exile, but more casual friendly. They also bring in a lot of quality of life things like an in-game auction house, and they always have some cool season mechanic. It's free to play, I always play on PC, there's also crossplay on mobile if you're into that, and now at long last, multiplayer mode has finally launched. You can now play co-op with friends. This new season mechanic, Whispering Mist, it's sort of like uh, Eldritch Cthulhu inspired. I got to try it out a bit, actually. It's got the sort of roguelite board game that happens between combats. We're also getting a new hero trait for Cat Eye Erica. The Golden Season Pass unlocks that new hero trait. It's also going to unlock all current hero traits in the game for you, plus a bunch of cosmetics and other rewards. They're also adding a new support skill called Activation Medium. This adds a bit more automation. For veterans of the game, we're getting a new end game mode, Divine Might Trials, plus the Twine Nightmare season mechanics are coming back. You can run into them in the Nether Realm. They've also streamlined the main campaign. You're going to get to end game faster than ever. And in celebration of Torchlight's one year in full release, everyone who just logs into the game is going to get a free SSR Battle Pack Spirit and a back cosmetic. So click the link below, check out Torchlight Infinite for free. In Helldivers 2 news, our campaign against the automatons was successful. We pushed them out of our galaxy forever. But then a couple days later, a massive automaton invasion fleet flew in. As had been teased in the lore, and we got new orders to slow down the fleet's advance. The automatons spread fast, took Cyberstan, and are making a deep push for Super Earth. The situation is looking grim. Some players are theorizing that we're soon to get some new stratagem to save us. Otherwise, we don't know how we're going to get out of this. And as of the time of this recording, uh, things still aren't clear. But I think we'll find out this weekend. Now, as part of this content rollout, we got a new defense mission that the community is vastly preferring to the civilian evacuation missions. It's almost like a tower defense mode where we hold off waves of enemies through layers of defenses. A lot of people already dislike the civilian evac missions, but this new defense mission is so fun that it makes the civvy mission feel even worse. Especially when combined with the planetary hazards like fire tornadoes that can just kill civilians without players having any agency or counterplay to save them. We also got this week the release of Tier 4 ship upgrades, which includes a circuit expansion upgrade to let lightning arcs jump to one additional helldiver, I mean enemy, which is a really good buff for the arc thrower. Enhanced combustion makes stratagems deal 25% more fire damage. The devs keep buffing fire damage or giving us ways to increase our fire damage. The flamethrower is ridiculous right now with this upgrade and the recent fire buffs. Here's the thing though, there's been a bug in the game, I, I think since launch, that makes damage over time effects basically do nothing if you're not the host. Something with server tick rates and the way the, the dot ticks is just it's not happening. So tons of players got the impression that things like the flamethrower just suck. And my theory is that the devs saw in their analytics that no one was using fire weapons or dot weapons in general, so they've buffed them in a patch last week, and now they gave us a way to buff them even more. The thing is, they're still crap for most players, but if you're the host, 
Holy crap, you are melting a charger in just a couple of seconds now. Then superior packing methodology makes resupply boxes refill support weapons to max. That is huge. It should be noted though that all of these upgrades are really expensive. They even cost requisition slips now in addition to what all the other stuff. Now, unfortunately, it was soon discovered that some of these upgrades weren't working properly. The superior packing methodology in particular, and the devs acknowledged the bug, and apparently as a temporary fix, you can just restart your game. Turning it off and on again just seems to fix everything. Then the new premium war bond, Democratic Detonation, also released this week. It costs a thousand super credits, and again, you can farm super credits in-game for free, and war bonds never expire, so there's no FOMO. You don't have just a month to get it, you can take forever. Now, people had speculated that the armor included in this war bond would have fire or explosion resistance, maybe extra grenades, anything that is themed towards explosions, but uh, nope. Turns out the armor just had an assortment of perks we've already seen before. And it's weird because the other premium war bonds had themes to them and the included armors had new perks related to that theme. In this war bond, we're just getting a random assortment of recycled perks. And probably worst of all, one armor was advertised as having the engineering kit perk, but when you go and buy it, you see that it actually has the servo assisted perk. The devs have since acknowledged that this is a mistake and that a hotfix will change the armor back to engineering kit. The war bond includes a new marksman rifle, the adjudicator, which seems underwhelming at best and completely useless at worst. The devs just don't seem to like sniper rifles for whatever reason. The new thermite grenade deals fire damage over time, but because of the bug, it's useless for most players. The saving grace of this war bond really has been the eruptor. It's a new gun that is basically the auto cannon as a primary. It can take down a charger with two well-placed shots to the mouth and is just all around looking like a really solid new primary. Players seem to be having a blast with this one. Blast. And it's not just because, oh, this is a new OP gun, because you don't necessarily want it in all situations. It's not great against close-up enemies, for instance, or small enemies, but it's just a really fun weapon to use. Overall, between all of this week's updates, we're seeing growing player sentiment that the devs should pause the content rollout and really just focus on fixing bugs for a while. The list of bugs seems to be growing with every update, and when the new updated stuff is being affected by bugs, well, it kind of makes it hard to enjoy the new content. The damage over time issue in particular, I think, should be priority one. Meanwhile, after Diablo 4 released on Xbox Game Pass, Xbox president Sarah Bond shared in an internal email to her team that Xbox had become the number one platform for Diablo 4. As per data collected by Game Insights, Diablo 4 jumped from being rank 40 on the most popular games on Xbox to rank 7 after the Game Pass release. Spots 1 through 6 go to Fortnite, Call of Duty, Minecraft, Rainbow Six Siege, GTA 5, and Roblox. Now, in an interview with IGN, Diablo boss Rod Ferguson clarified Sarabon's statement. Xbox had become the number one platform for Diablo 4 with respect to daily active users. In terms of total players across all platforms, that's a different story. On the Game Pass launch days, then yes, the Xbox group was the largest audience playing the game, but Xbox is not the number one of all time. The Season 4 PTR for D4 came to an end this week, but not before some players found in-game, and data miners also confirmed, an elixir that juices up Helltide. It's called the Profane Mine Cage. It was allegedly found in a cellar during Helltide, so potentially now a reason to actually go into cellars in Helltide, because there wasn't any reason before. And what it does is for one hour, it increases Helltide monster level by 10. And it also buffs Cinder drop rate and threat gain. Threat is a new system where it's like GTA, you get more stars and more police, or in this case, demons come after you. Now it's unclear if this is tied to the season theme or what. The devs definitely didn't speak about this new elixir. But having some way to increase the difficulty and reward of Helltide is just a great idea. At Endgame, once you have a solid build together, Helltide becomes trivially easy. We see the concept of juicing in Path of Exile. You consume resources to juice maps to increase the difficulty and the reward. If Diablo 4 can introduce that concept via 
elixirs. That could be a cool way to keep a meaningful degree of challenge for when our builds are just obliterating the content. But now the PTR is over, I think it's fair to say that it has been a resounding success. It has restored a ton of faith in the game, it has renewed excitement for Diablo 4, and in that same interview with IGN, Rod Ferguson has as well called PTR a success, but he's not promising a PTR every season. Basically, he does want to keep an element of surprise for players for the seasons, he feels that's important, and so they're going to do PTRs only when they feel they need to. Now, while the PTR has been a success, does that mean everything is perfect? No, of course not, but the PTR is for testing and gathering feedback to ensure that when Season 4 launches, it'll be the best it can be. That's why it's going to take so long, May 14th, over a month, before we actually get the launch of the season. They got all this time to fix it so that we can avoid some of the common complaints that we would see at the start of a season that could have been easy fixes. And speaking of those things that need to be worked on, uh, one issue that I see come up again and again is veiled crystals in the PTR. A lot of people feel that there's a scarcity of them. And I feel the problem here is that so many different systems we engage with in the PTR required veiled crystals. So they end up being a bottleneck to multiple crafting options. I don't know if we need more veiled crystals to drop or for rares to break down into more veiled crystals or for the veiled crystal costs for some crafting options to be lowered or maybe for some crafting options to have their Veiled Crystal cost removed entirely and replaced with an increase to the cost of other materials. Whatever it is, it feels like something needs to be tuned here. Then another big question going into BTR was, will we still feel like we need a loot filter with itemization 2.0? I've always held that a loot filter is a solution to a problem, and if you can fix the problem at its source, you don't need a loot filter. Well, right now, I still feel like we need a loot filter, but that could possibly be fixed by having items with greater affixes more clearly signaled, as well as uh, uber unique drops. Basically, when you're farming the uber bosses at some point in a season, all you care about is getting uber unique drops. You stop picking up legendaries, you stop even picking up the non uber uniques, all you're looking for is what could be a, a nice big red beam. Similarly, you reach a point with itemization where you only care about items with at least one greater affix, then eventually with two greater affixes, etc. And on the note of greater affixes, a concern that I had about them when I first read about them was that they would be equivalent to Diablo 3 ancient items. Basically just better gear that has 30% higher rolls on it that obsoletes non-ancients. They're not particularly interesting, but they're mandatory for pushing endgame. You can't just say no to 30% more power. But I think greater affixes may avoid those same issues because it's not an on or off system like with D3 Ancients, where you're either fully 30% stronger or you're not, at least in any given slot. You could have on any single piece of gear one or more greater affixes. It just becomes more granular and nuanced. So you might have an item here that has two greater affixes on it. But is that going to replace your item with just one greater affix if that one greater affix that you have on the item you're wearing is a really important affix for your build and the item you found with two greater affixes, they're not as important. I mean, yes, ultimately everyone wants just maxed out greater affixes on every piece of gear, but I believe that will be an unrealistic goal for the average player at least. And so it'll be just about finding some combination of greater aspects that you're content with, and then you won't feel like you're missing out on too much power by not maxing out everything everywhere. I think that's ultimately what ARPGs boil down to. It's you're always striving for perfect gear, but perfect gear should be almost impossible to reach unless you're absolute crazy blaster, but that you're not going to feel bad for not reaching perfect gear. It's always that infinite goal to, to seek, but that the game makes you still feel good and accomplished at calling it quits at some point. And I think to some degree that necessitates the maxed out perfect stuff not being all that much more powerful than a good enough state. Now, of course, this is all in theory. We'll have to play out a full season to see how things actually feel. And I, it's, it's the same thing with masterworking. It, it seems good as a system, but after playing it out for a full season, will all of these systems still feel cool 
and still feel rewarding or will they feel like compulsory grinds? And if you don't do them, you suck. This is a really tough balancing act to introduce a system that feels like a reward for engaging with it rather than a punishment for not wanting to engage with it. Similarly with tempering, overall, great system. Super fun affixes in there, the double skill triggers, the increased radius and, and stacking these things. It makes us feel like we're breaking the game and that's fun. I think that's the great illusion that the devs need to maintain to make us feel like we're breaking the game, but we're actually breaking it in a way that is controlled and expected by them. But after a season of playing with tempering, of bricking items, are we still going to like it or are we going to have a lot of feels bad moments? I think we're going to have to see. Then apart from some obvious balance issues that need to be fixed with tempering, I'm concerned about how barbarians can stack four tempered weapons while some classes only get one. Rogues get three, but overall there's this discrepancy that we've known about from pre-launch. And we always knew that Barbarians would get four weapon slots and thus be able to stack more legendary aspects. And people were like, well, Barbarians are going to be overpowered. And the devs said they wanted to balance around that, that Barbarians would be more dependent on getting gear to reach full power. But now with how powerful these tempered affixes are and seeing how ridiculously strong Barbarians were on PTR, is it still going to be possible to maintain a balance or are Barbarians just going to be the best now? Because when they first balanced Barbarians as a base class, they didn't have tempering in mind. So now they're adding a new power source and they're not nerfing Barbarians in other places. Now, along with asking for a loot filter, something that a lot of people were also asking for was more stash space. So do we still feel like we need more stash tabs? Well, I can say as a hoarder, I think we're okay for now. The changes to Aspects and the Codex of Wisdom are a night and day difference. You don't have to hold on to backup gear or gear that you want to one day upgrade. You can just keep re-imprinting and re-upgrading the same gear. You don't have to store copies of Aspects. You don't have to go through this great burden just to change out your build and need an entirely separate set of gear. You can now just experiment so much more freely and with little consequence. The quality of life difference is so big that I just cannot go back to playing regular D4 now. I, I gotta wait until May 14th. Now, an obvious issue on PTR that was to be expected, things were not balanced. Many things were overtuned. Again, that's all to be expected. We saw this all the time in Diablo 3. It was not a problem. They would get the balance right or close enough by the time the season would launch. In fact, I released a video this week on the five craziest builds or best builds from PTR. I picked one build per class, do check out that video. Some of those builds will definitely be nerfed, not all of them. And the ones that are gonna be nerfed, I don't think they're gonna be nerfed into oblivion. That's why I picked them for the video because there were some broken builds that were being caused by bugs. And hopefully those bugs will all get fixed in time for season launch. Druids in particular had absolutely broken builds because you can infinitely stack hurricane damage. Overpower had some bugged interaction that was hitting for just insane amounts of damage. Another issue that seems to persist, that uh, it feels like it's been in the game for a while now. I thought they fixed it, but I guess not. Poison damage that enemies are dealing to us still feels like it's it's overtuned. Even with maxed out poison resistance, I just feel like I get a poison dot on me and I gotta like chug potions, multiple potions, just to avoid dying. Also, trying out running the pit with a team, I'm actually not sure I love the experience. The pit, really, really fun to play solo. You're in a team. Whenever anyone in the team dies, the entire team is docked 30 seconds or more from their 10 minute timer. So just one person dying over and over can fail your run. And that especially sucks if you're the one who used up your material to open the pit level and then your resources consumed for nothing because of something completely outside of your control. Someone else is dying over and over again. I don't know what exactly the solution to this is. I I think we could just go back to the Diablo 3 system, force everyone to have to consume a resource to open a pit level. This would also mean giving everyone the full resources at the end of the pit instead of just the person who opened the pit. But at least this way, everyone is incentivized to not just die repeatedly in the pit run. It doesn't fully solve the issue, but it helps. Because as it stands, doing pit group runs is heavily disincentivized if you're the host. And speaking of the pit, Pit bosses in general, I think, may be overtuned. Either that or the rest of the pit is undertuned, one or the other. 
It, it just feels like you easily cruise through a pit in two minutes and then you blow the rest of your timer dying to the boss repeatedly. Or at least that's been my experience. Maybe I just need to learn to better dodge the boss mechanics because right now it, it just feels like the strategy is to kill the pit boss before those other boss mechanics come in and kill you. Yes, they are telegraphed. Yes, you can dodge them. But sometimes the combination of boss mechanics just come together in a way that it feels like you can't really do much. You just make a bad choice and, and you're screwed. The damage is so big that you get one shot. I don't know, maybe it's a skill issue. Uh, maybe it's a build issue. I can admit that. But regardless, even if I, I could get better and I could get a better build, it doesn't change the fact that the pit goes from Hello Kitty Island Adventure to Dark Souls 4 in about half a second when you step through that boss board. Oh, oh, one thing that will feel terrible in Diablo 4 Season 4. Grinding our Glyph XP. Nightmare Vaults are gone. Those are a fun way to level our Glyph XP. They are boosting how fast we gain Glyph XP, but still. Helltide will be super fun, the Pit will be super fun, and Nightmare Dungeons are just going to feel like crap in comparison. I expect a lot of complaints about this once Season 4 starts. Oh, and come summer, players in China will be able to play Diablo 4 for the first time. Blizzard has reached a new partnership agreement with NetEase, and all Blizzard games are going to get brought back to China. Back in 2008, they first entered this partnership with NetEase, because in order to publish games in China, you need to partner with a Chinese distributor. And for 14 years, NetEase was Blizzard's partner. But then, in 2022, the two companies failed to come to an agreement when they were renewing their contract, and that was largely due to a communication breakdown via their translators. NetEase was referencing the impending Microsoft acquisition, and Bobby Kotick interpreted that they were making a threat that they would have China try to block the deal. There was a nasty breakup with NetEase employees streaming themselves destroying a World of Warcraft statue at their offices. So it's not exactly a surprise that just a couple of months after Bobby Kotick is gone, bam, Blizzard and NetEase have a good relationship again. And also Microsoft has entered into a separate agreement with NetEase to bring NetEase titles to Xbox and other platforms. Meanwhile, Ubisoft has pissed everyone off again by revoking game licenses from people who purchased The Crew. Released in 2014, The Crew was an online-only racing game, and in December 2023, Ubisoft announced that it would be shutting down its servers in March 2024. Without its online servers, the game would become unplayable, and that's exactly what happened, which is fine. But here's the thing. The crew was sold under a perpetual license, not under a subscription. It was being sold as a good, not as a service. So sure, there's no more servers to support the game. But in theory, if some folks come together and manage to create private servers or some kind of single player mod, they could still keep playing. You still own the game itself, right? Well, now instead of just delisting the game from stores so that it is no longer purchasable, Ubisoft is revoking the licenses of those who purchase the game. So you can no longer even try to download and mod the game. You can't have the files anymore. It's all just gone. It's one thing to shut down the game servers. You can't expect companies to host game servers forever. They shouldn't even be forced to then mod the game to allow private servers. I would love it if they did. It would be a huge good guy move, but I don't think they should be forced to do so. But they definitely should not be able to literally take back the game from you so that you can't even have the files anymore. At least not without issuing a refund. And I think this all leads into why when the trailer for Star Wars Outlaws released this week, it got a ton of downvotes, despite the game looking pretty decent. I think people are just done with Ubisoft's crap. It's just been negative headline after negative headline about the company for a while, with the latest complaints being about the pricing of Star Wars Outlaws Ultimate Edition. At $130 American, it includes cosmetics, three days early access ahead of its August 30th release date, and a season pass that will include two post-launch DLCs and an exclusive mission. For a story-driven single-player game, it all just feels like a bit much. And even though this isn't exactly out of the ordinary these days, it seems a lot of people are just fed up. Whether these downvotes will actually translate into lost sales is to be seen. And that's going to wrap up this week's video. But do be sure to check out last week's video in which we discuss whether the Blizzard devs are really listening to us 
or not. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to join Riker's Raiders for more gaming content.